These days, getting into medical school is some of the hardest part of becoming a doctor. And once you're there, the question is, are there pearls of wisdom which can help you? In this episode, I'm gonna to try to help you along with that, as well as give you a few pro tips on what to do and what not to do. So this is advice to medical students. I'll have a separate episode for pre-meds, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are in. And then also some, another one for residents from my perspective. So let me know what you think. Join us on the channel. Hey guys, Dr. Nene here. I practice as a cardiothoracic, vascular, and general surgeon, and I'm now a health tech innovator who wants to improve lifespans and lifestyles. So stay healthy, stay curious, and keep watching. Hey guys, welcome back. Today's video is very close to my heart because I went through the journey of becoming a doctor and then from there going through residency. It's not an easy task. So let's skip right to it. Now you've gotten into med school, some of the hardest math you'll ever do. Congratulations. But now the journey just begins. That first year is all the healthy year. It's pathophysiology, no. It's physiology, it's all of the biochemistry, it's all of the anatomy, and all of the late night rote sessions where you try to assimilate a ton of knowledge and figure out how things work. It's pharmacology, it's all kinds of other things pulled into one. You will be working the hardest you have in your whole life. And so the key there is trying to bring all of this together. And the first step is make sure you're on a tight schedule. And in that schedule, take care of yourself. And that means your health and your mental health. Part of that is making sure that you uh, sleep and wake properly, that you eat properly, don't cram, and make sure that you work with your peers so that you can help them as well as help yourself. Because it's a collaborative thing, you're not competing against each other. Don't worry about what other people are doing or how they've done, because everyone studies differently. In that first year, you learn all about physiology and the healthy year, as I call it, where all of the systems are intact. That brings you to the second year. And in my first year, much of it was pass-fail, so we didn't have to worry about grades. We came together as a class, and the camaraderie went way up. Everyone's worried about keeping your grades up throughout your medical journey just to get into med school. Well, it happens again once you're in med school because now you have to get a prestiged residency. But that should not be your concern. What you, you should be concerned about is taking care of your patients and why you're doing it, and also taking care of yourself and taking care of your peers. In the second year, you'll transition to a unhealthy year. And it can be unhealthy for you if you don't watch it, but the main thing is you're working about pathophysiology and aberrant anatomy. You're working through how things happen in systems when they go awry. You're dealing with other areas of pharmacology. You're dealing with molecular biology. All of these topics are very, very interesting. And you wouldn't have gone to med school if you didn't like science and the applied nature of science and medicine. At the same time, you'll start to see patients as you do your intro to uh, your clinical years um, in the latter part of your second year. Again, the key is to be organized, to stay healthy, and to make sure that you keep ties to all of your classmates and uh, to your mentors. Um, keep asking the right questions. Why? You know, what is it I like? What is it I don't like? That, at the end of your second year, typically there'll be some type of exam, at least in the US, it was the USMLE, and you'll have to pass through that. Uh, and USMLE part one takes uh, place in, in the end of the second year and third year and you'll have to just figure all of that out. By the third year, you start your clinical clerkships, and those will be in certain defined disciplines like surgery, uh, medicine, um, OBGYN, psychiatry, whatnot, and it'll be your first introduction to actually seeing patients. Now all of a sudden, you're not just this bookish scholar who has to learn everything and basically uh, bring it out on a test, but you're actually someone who applies that knowledge 
and you're seeing patients to do some deductive and inductive reasoning. For me, the third year was very exciting because I actually got to apply my knowledge and I also got to work with people, which I enjoyed doing, and also take, get some sort of reward in the fact that these patients would often get better with what you figured out from the tremendous amount of knowledge you had assimilated over the last however many years. At the same time, it can be a grueling year because different types of specialties have different schedules. And so, in particular, your surgical year, I never saw light for a long period of time. We would start at 4.30 a.m. and get back by 10 p.m. and we were often on call with the surgical teams who had even worse surgical hours. And then, you know, depending on the specialty, whether it was medicine or radiology, all of them were, were very demanding, but in different ways. You also get to see a little bit about what the differences are. And this will help you later when you're deciding on what type of residency to do. And in my mind, it, we separated it into medical specialties, surgical specialties, and interventional specialties, uh, and then radiologic specialties. Each one had their pros and cons. And in medical specialties, you saw patients and you took care of them on an ongoing basis for the long term. You would see them in your clinic, or you'd see them in an ER, or you'd see them in a hospital, and then you would follow their course in different degrees. If you were an internist in an office, or a pediatrician, or um, you saw patients in a clinic, you would see them once, you would give them a defined um, evaluation, and then you'd write something called a SOAP note, Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan, and then they would follow through that with prescriptions, and then you may see them in follow-up. By comparison, if you were seeing them in an ER, you might see them for even shorter durations, where you had to figure out their focused problem, give them a solution, or give them a referral to another doctor who could make that distinction, whether it was surgical or medical or psychiatric or otherwise. If you were a hospitalist by comparison or an intensivist, you would see them in the hospital through their hospital course, and then after that, you would likely not see them again. Finally, if you were a surgeon, it often meant that you would see them preoperatively in your clinics, make the distinctions, or if you were a heart surgeon like I was as well, you would see them in the hospital if they had a, a heart attack or had something that needed evaluation, treat them during the course of that, and then see them back in the clinic once they had recovered um, to make sure they were doing okay. And then after roughly one to three months, um, you would turn them back over to their internist or to their regular doctors. And then finally, if you were a radiologist, you would see their films. You may not even see a patient. And <laughs> you would be in a dark room kind of looking at how things were going and making diagnoses, but you would be part of the whole uh, team uh, the clinical team trying to help them make decisions based on the radiological images or you could be an interventional radiologist where you inter intervene on patients using radiologic techniques through catheter based uh, techniques and otherwise. Interestingly some of the disciplines have started spilling into others and vice versa. In medicine if you're an interventional cardiologist or you're an internist uh, or a family practitioner who does scopes or things like that you may end up doing invasive procedures. Similarly, for general surgeons, a lot of time you may spend in clinics seeing patients and helping them with non-operative uh, treatments. So there was a little bit of spillover. What did differ though is the training afterwards in terms of the residency. And generally the surgical disciplines required more training, whereas the medical disciplines required less, and the radiologic disciplines were somewhere in between. Um, finally, in the, after you finished the third year and you got some exposure and you started to decide what your path was, whether it was medical, surgical, radiologic, or interventional, you would decide on doing some sub-internships where you would go in to another institution and sort of audition, if you will. And so I did a few of those because originally I wanted to do orthopedics, actually, and then I switched over to general and, and vascular and heart surgery. And so I got to get more experience with um, guys practicing in that for a longer period of time and saw what they did on a day-to-day -day basis um, in different settings. Um, and during the sub-eyes, you kind of get a broad reckoning. So your fourth year has a few 
um, regulated classes, but a lot of them are sub-internships. And then you're also applying to institutions yet again and applying for uh, internship and residency. Um, by the March in the U.S. of your um, senior year, you are, have applied for the match, and depending on what you applied for, there's a match day where they'll tell you where you matched and what you'll be doing. And alternatively, if you didn't match, you would scramble to find an internship where you could then start and then reapply. Um, and then finally, the, the thing is you will have taken your USMLE in year two with the healthy years and the unhealthy year, and then you'll take the second part in your uh, second part of medical school, and then the third part you'll take after your one year of residency. So the three parts you'll finish, and once you're done with that, you'll be licensed as a doctor if you apply. But that was the four years. Now, what are the take homes for me and what made a difference for me? Having healthy relationships with your peers, uh, friendships which basically live on even now. My roommates were critical for me in making sure my, my brain stayed connected. And honestly, med school is the most grueling time of your life and very, very difficult to get on. I mean, you think being a doctor is challenging. In med school, you're just learning to be a doctor and you're making that transition from just being a student who has to get the best grades of anyone to someone who actually takes that information and applies it to saving lives. And so that transition is critical. The second thing is choose your mentors wisely. You'll see a lot of different people and a lot of times you'll make a decision on a specialty path based on who the coolest doctors are. And the funny part is if they're very chilled in their skin, you might like one day urology or you might like orthopedics or you might like um, internal medicine just because the, the mentors are so cool. Make sure that you ask them the hard questions because every specialty has its great days and every specialty has its tough days and you got to be able to deal with both. The third thing is make sure you take time out for yourself. Now look, if you've gotten into med school, chances are you've regulated everything and you have to stay on board but it's not that simple because just when you think everything is perfect and you've got your study habits down, then throw in the fact that you have to study when you're on call after you've already been up for 20, 30 hours. It's, it's a whole different world. And so all of that you have to sort of know what you're getting into and that's even more so in residency where oftentimes you're the person making the decisions in the minute to minute and you'll be in a hierarchy of some sort with an attending and then chief resident and a resident and whatnot. Uh, and we'll get to that in another episode. But the bottom line is even in med school, you, you're learning and then eventually you're taking orders for a while until you become independent. And that transition is not an easy one. Um, next thing is, as far as exercise and eating, you have to dial this in early and often. And a lot of times, you know, we would joke about it that, you know, sleep when you can, eat when you can, and don't miss with the pancreas. Those are real rules, right? You were going at 100 miles a minute, you didn't always have time to eat. And so the main thing was making sure you covered your check boxes on those. Um, we always had a joke that, you know, a shower would equal at least one to two hours of sleep. Because when you were sleep deprived, taking a shower would freshen you up and you'd feel like you could go a little bit longer. But there were days in residency in particular where I was so tired that you would see my, my writing and my charts go from legible to chicken scratch in a matter of minutes because I would just fall asleep on the charts and my nurses would come and help me and say, hey doc, have a coffee or do something like that. Not ideal, I agree, but when I was training it was a little different in that you, could, you, you were obligated to work 100 hours or more and that was cut down later after I finished to 80 hours for the new residents coming in. Uh, but you will find that you are used to that. You guys are soldiers in that you didn't get to this point without doing something right and you're, you're more than capable. So there you have it. This is a taste. I would love to hear the comments from uh, doctors as well as medical students as well as aspiring doctors and leave the questions in the comments below. We'll leave some pretty cool uh, 
uh, links in the description. And as always, it's a pleasure talking to you guys and meeting with you. And I would be open to taking any questions. So you can go to my website, drnene.com, and leave any questions you have. And I'm always willing to help you guys. My goal is to make it better for humanity. And I'm sure that's why you went into medicine and that's what you want to do. And so do the best you can. Learn everything you can now because it will make a difference in someone's life. If not your own, then everyone around you in your lifetimes. And you know, my appreciation to all of you guys going through this because it's not easy. And I know that and you know that. But it's because you do it that people stay alive. So thank you in advance. Uh, one day you might be taking care of me, who knows. But the bottom line is, um, if you like what I say, hit the like button, hit the share button to share it with all of your family and friends, and hit the bell icon so you'll get new episodes that we're dreaming up. Also leave comments in the boxes down below if you think of something that you want to hear from us. And um, then finally, all the best to you because it's a long and tough road and you have made it so far. So my congratulations to you and your families, for everyone who went the extra mile to get you to where you are. Don't take it for granted because it is a privilege and an honor. And it's an honor to talk to you guys about it. Take care, talk to you soon.